Okay, I think we're ready. Uh, this is creating a collaborative environment with families and communities to become a certified family-friendly school. Jill Hanley is our presenter today, and she is the principal at Kenwood Elementary. This is her 16th year as principal. She's led Kenwood to have one of the highest MAP growth achievements of Title I schools in her district across subgroups. Be selected as a bright spot school by the Pritchard Committee, selected as a state and national school of character, and most recently recognized by the National ESEA Distinguished School, Solution Tree Success Story School, and the first school in the state to be certified as family friendly. In addition to leading her own school, Jill mentors new and aspiring principals and has presented at the local, state, and national level. 2017, Jill was named Hillary, Hillard Alliance Principal of the Year. All right, thanks, Brooke. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we've made it last last session of the day. I don't know if that's a blessing or a curse to be in this spot. And like, it's either you've made it or I'm holding you from the next thing. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. As Brooke mentioned, um, I am Jill Handley, principal of Kenwood Elementary. And so, Brooke, you can see my screen okay and everything. Presentation's good. Okay. All right. So uh, I always think it's important to tell everybody a little bit about myself uh, so you know who, who's talking to you, if you will. Um, so again, like Brooke mentioned, uh, I'm happy to be here at Kenwood. Um, in addition to being a principal for the last 16 years, um, I also am a proud mom to these two girls right here. Uh, last year, I survived being a mom to two seniors. Um, my oldest daughter was a senior in college and my youngest daughter was a senior in high school. So Whew, an emotional year. So it was a way to celebrate all of their great accomplishments. There we are in Italy this past summer, which was a really exciting venture. Um, I'm also a proud fur mom to Walter. Um, you can't tell it in this picture, but he is a 21 pound cat. And he's not a man coon. That's what I have to always clarify. But nevertheless, there he is. Um, I'm currently on the home stretch of, of my doctorate. Um, should be graduating in May uh, at the University of Louisville, so I'm excited around that. Uh, and as it turns out, it's around sense of belonging with families. Um, and in all of my spare time, um, I do host a podcast called "Be the Leader You Deserve." I always say that, you know, there's uh, we've all worked for that leader where we would have done anything for, her, brought our toothbrushes on Sunday to scrub the toilets, and then we've all had that boss that we wanted, you know, we, we you couldn't have doubled our salary to want to continue working for. So, I just really work hard to try to think through the lens of, you know, we all deserve to be that leader that we deserve. All right, so enough about me, a little bit about um, proud school that I lead. So Kenwood Elementary is a beautifully diverse place. Uh, we usually have around um, 575 to 600 kiddos in our building, um, usually teeter around 85% free and reduced lunch. So we are title one, um, about 40 to 45% of our kiddos are multilingual learners. So we were linguistically gifted. Um, they come to us from about uh, uh, 25 different countries, speak about 30 different languages. Um, and so we, uh, um, or had that backwards. Yep, there we go. Uh, but it's it's just an incredibly beautifully diverse place to be. And so as Brooke mentioned, uh, what you're going to hear about today, <clears throat> because it's only 30 minutes, uh, I'm just going to kind of highlight some of the things that I feel that really um, elevated or we, we took away uh, that were some game changers for us as a result of becoming family friendly certified. Um, so it was a really great process. So if you've not started that or looked into it, then I highly advocate that you do that. All right. So when you walk away today, here are our goals. One, um, hopefully that you'll be able to have some tools uh, where you'll analyze your current systems and structures to ensure that equity exists for all of your families. Uh, two, hopefully you're going to be able to walk away um, with uh, ways to increase sense of belonging for your families, um, improve engagement with even your most disengaged families, build capacity and agency with all families, and enhance your community partnerships. Now, here's the truth. That's a lot of uh, deliverables in 30 minutes. At the end, there will be a link to a Padlet that has a lot of different resources that I don't necessarily, some are in the presentation, some are not. Um, I, I presented um, at ASCD in the, in, the um, in October and it was an hour session. So I tried to uh, cherry pick some of the highlights to put into this session. And I do talk sort of fast, so I'll slow down if you need me to. 
All right, so where does it start? Um, for us, and I always talk to the families, that, that engagement for students, uh, for them to experience optimal success, it's kind of like a triangle, just like you see there on the screen with the student at the top and the school at one side and the family on the other. And if either of those vertices are broken, then the student is not going to experience ultimate success. At Kenwood, um, in addition to optimizing the success of our students, we want to make sure that we uh, focus all of our efforts on equity, inclusion, and sense of belonging. That's a different session probably, but nevertheless, we really try to filter all of our decision making with students and with families through that lens. All right, so here's the truth of the matter. I, I am an avid learner. I love to attend conferences. I love to listen to podcasts, read, watch videos, you name it. I love to learn. And I am queen of, I put Dory on there if you've seen Finding Nemo of that. Whoop, 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 whoop. I am queen of bringing back great ideas for my staff. And the, and the things that we've done over the years have been amazing. We've tried some really great what I'm going to call pop-up shop ideas for family engagement. Uh, we've done the family on a row. We've done this. We've done shout. We've you name it. We've done it. Anytime, like when I go away and come back, sometimes the staff's like, "Oh," because I've had to learn to temper myself. Well, then after a while, we would be like three years down the road. In fact, when we were doing our self-assessment, we started saying, "Hey, do you remember when we did that that one year? Why don't we do that anymore?" Or yeah, that was a good idea. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, that year, that was great. Why don't we do that anymore? Well, what we found is that the reason why that exists is because um, when we planned them, they were a good idea, but we haven't exactly planned with a sustainability in mind. Therefore, um, that's one of the things that we had to, to fail forward with. Anybody else kind of ever in that that place to where you're like, oh, great idea. And the next year, it just doesn't continue because you really didn't make that long-term plan. Okay. Thank you, Jenny, for shaking your head and not making me feel like I'm the only one. So thank you for that. All right. All right. So what about sustainability? Well, here's the truth of the matter. This is a teacher's plate and this isn't everything, right? So it's not that teachers don't feel like family engagement is important. They know it's important right? It's just that their plates are incredibly full. I mean, in addition to, you know, showing up every day, uh, you know, they're focusing on the, the trauma, not just of the students, but themselves. Maybe they're trying to implement PBL, blended learning, personalized learning, standards-based grading, technology proficiency, transition readiness, acceleration, assessment analysis, meaningful feedback, and the list goes on and on. And so, asking them to do what is necessary to uh, go deep with families is not something that they don't believe in. It's just something that if we can't add one more thing to their plate or they may quit <laughs> as they're already doing. So we have to think through ideas of how if we are going to say family engagement is a priority and mean that family engagement is a priority, then we have to make decisions that show that. So one of the decisions that we've made at Kenwood, um, you know, I always say that you can always tell how schools prioritize things by how they spend their money. I think the same could be true said for individuals, but, but you want to follow uh, school priorities, look at their budgetary decisions. And so for us, uh, uh, right before the pandemic, what we were recognizing is that uh, we, this is the feeling we were having. Oh, we feel like our core instruction is so good. We feel like we've really got a great handle on MTSS and our interventions are, are top notch. Oh, but our kids, we feel like we were doing all we could do during the day when we had the kids, right? It just still wasn't enough. So we felt like, well, if we're going to move the needle a little bit further, then what we've got to do is truly engage as partners with families. And so what that meant was that we were having to reevaluate how we were spending money, because I'm not sure about your school or your district, but in our school, there are no money trees planted in the backfield. So um, we had, it was, it was tough. We, we had to, um, we were looking and there were things that we had been doing for years um, that we thought were really powerful things such as reading recovery, math interventions. And while we still believe those things are highly important, we were looking at, if we're trying to think global impact, what's going to have the most global impact for us. And so for us, it was having to make some shifts toward um, 
creating more of a family engagement team that extended beyond the classroom teacher. Now we have a full-time family resource center coordinator who's great. The problem is, is that, or the challenge, it's not a problem having additional people is always great, but the challenge is, uh, it's really kind of twofold. One, that means one person who's trying to do it all. Two, that position is a classified position that was created kind of through the lens of a neighborhood place. So the idea behind that position is to remove non-academic barriers, which we have a lot of. But what we were finding is that some of the needs that we had were really someone who understood classroom needs through the lens of a teacher. So therefore, right before the pandemic hit, we had just finalized our budget for the following year. And we proposed to create, at that time, we created the position called a family liaison position. Thank goodness we did because school shuts down, we're all working from home, um, families don't know how to get on their Chromebooks and all the things. So thankfully for Amy McDonald, who you'll see there on the left, um, you see it says family ambassador now. The reason why we changed the title is that our first year liaison, people weren't understanding what that meant. That's a pretty technical term. As I mentioned, we have a pretty large international population. So what we were finding is the word ambassador was not only more of a unifying term, um, but it, it was kind of um, a, a more friendly, um, and doing just that, being an ambassador for our families and for our school. So as a result of Amy's leadership, she didn't do it by herself, she was able to commandeer a team. Um, our school was in the top three for engagement for the entire year of NTI, so we were really excited for that. Um, so we really, then we got to come back to school in sort of a hybrid model, um, and then we just kind of built upon that success. What we noticed is that when somebody's full-time job full-time certified job is to to lead family engagement that's where the that's where the power is at because don't get me wrong if that could be like my whole job <laughs> I, I i love that too um, i'm incredibly passionate about family engagement but the truth of the matter is is that it's only one of the hats that I wear. So it can't be my, even though I oversee the committee, um, it's not my full-time job. So Amy was able to lead that charge. And so what we were noticing is that as a result of the time and attention she was able to get into homes, um, we were able to flex her schedule because let's face it, not everybody's available from eight to 3.30. So she was able to, you know, some days she'd work 12 to 7.30. Why? Because she had a family night or a family's a couple house home visits she was doing in the evening, or there would be days to where she'd work a Saturday or a Sunday instead. So it really just provided a lot more flexibility. You know, we can't expect families to, to always be on our schedule. So after that, we, um, we learned from our success and we thought, wow, we were really getting some traction by having a family ambassador now we're missing the piece of the community. And so what we did was we took an already existing position. Um, Ms. Cook, she's our Compassionate Schools teacher. We were fortunate enough to be have been part of the Compassionate Schools project. She teaches compassion, kindness, um, kind of about identity, social justice, uh, mindfulness. Uh, and so we were able to kind of reallocate some of her time in the day to uh, become our community liaison. So everything that Amy does directly with families Karen does directly with community partners. And so the two of them working together are with our Family Resource Center coordinator have really just kind of been a powerhouse. But again, those were powerful decisions that we had to make, which meant we had to say no to some of the things that we'd always done. All right, so with the, those two ladies, uh, they were two of our, our lead members of our family community engagement team. And so being strategic about um, planning and meeting is critical. If you wait for things, you will always be in reactive mode. And while we, they do a lot of reactive work because needy families have a reactionary need, uh, our goal is to be able to put more proactive supports in place so that we don't have to do as much reacting. And so what we do is that we um, we meet bi-weekly and there's an agenda and you can just kind of see right there um, on the left, just kind of what it looks like. I will um, uh, essentially everybody's everybody there's a block that has everybody's name in it I'll send the agenda out ahead of time people will link what they want to talk about so it keeps us focused we maintain our goals our norms on there so that it drives the work that we do and then the other thing that we've done is we've created a, a yearly family engagement calendar because that way that allows us to be proactive if we know that we're going to do a, a kindergarten readiness night in May it's on there in May, but the planning for it usually is on there in February. Why? Because in February, we need to start ordering the things. Uh, 
And the greatest thing about linking, I don't know if you are like a link junkie like me, but man, it's so great because if you've ever been back to the Dory story of what was that document called? Yeah, where, where, wonder what folder that's in. Mm, yeah, so now we just link everything so that it, we were able to work smarter, not harder. Um, all right, so the self-assessment. So going through the family-friendly certification last year, it required that we um, we engage in a self-assessment. And so, uh, Brooke, I don't know if you want to drop that in the self-assessment in the, in the chat. Um, and going through the self-assessment was an incredibly powerful yet humbling experience. It's, it's broken down into five components, and it really requires you to, to dig deeply. Because we were thinking, yeah, we're family friendly. Yeah, we've got good relationships. Yeah, we communicate. But when we took the assessment, we were like, well, we felt pretty good, but we still have a way to go. Uh, primarily because a lot of our good was with a certain population of students, and we realized that we weren't reaching all families. So that really, that work with the self assessment guided our decision making of how we were going to improve and become a friend, become more family friendly with ours with our families. All right. So as I mentioned. There are five areas of focus with regards to the self-assessment relationship building, communication, shared responsibility, advocacy, and community partnership. Uh, and as I was in a session earlier and I mentioned this, uh, we pride ourselves in the relationships that we have with our families, as I'm sure you do as well. It was so there, so it was really interesting to know that that's the place we started. Even though that was the place we rated highest, we knew that we still had work to do to enhance our, our relationships with all families before we could move on to advocacy and shared responsibility and community partnerships. We needed to deepen those relationships. So that's really where a lot of the work came from last year. So what I'm gonna share with you now, I just went through and kind of chose one thing from each of the five areas, because I've only got 30 minutes to share with you all uh, of some things that we felt were kind of um, super important to, to mention. And again, I don't expect that, that any of these are new ideas, uh, but hopefully maybe you can grab one activity that you like. All right, so the first one as it relates to relationships. So welcoming environment. Um, people, you know, I know if, you, if you're familiar with, uh, well, his name just escaped me. Gosh, I can't believe this. Look, it's sitting right over here on my shelf somewhere. Um, yeah, Dr. Steve Constantino with Engage Every Family. One of the things he talks to you about is doing um, kind of an environment walk at your school. Uh, if you were new or a stranger to your building, and you walked up to your building, how friendly is it and easy to navigate? That sounds crazy. We did that. Man, it was an eye opener. We recognized that, oh, there's no signage or if there's signage, it's all in English. Um, and so one of the things that we did was we kind of did a remake on our lobby. You can see that when, you know, welcome to Kenwood where the world comes to learn, some of our top languages are there as well. Uh, what you can't see in the window is it's kind of a little poster that says we speak your language in different places. Uh, when you walk into the front office, uh, we have some, we have multiple devices and, and resources available for, for multilingual families. Um, and so just making sure, you know, and talking with your front office staff about what that looks like to be a welcoming environment. The other idea I'm going to just give a uh, credit where credit is due. We stole from Grace James Academy. Um, they made the decision that um, because prior to a year and a half ago, Right there where you can see our parking lot, those front row, it was full of for all staff, reserved for the principal, reserved for the assistant principal, reserved for the clerk, reserved for everybody except the families, <laughs> except the visitors, the people who mean the most, right? And so if you truly say that we value you being here in our building, but we have no place for you to park. And, and parking is a limit. Parking is kind of a, a sore spot for us here at Kenwood. We have this great, beautiful property. We have all these tiny parking spots. And so um, understanding, and that was a commitment to value that when people show up, how welcoming it is it for them to have to drive around like it's a midnight madness sale, right? Trying to find a parking lot. And so again, I give I give uh, credit to, to Rhonda Cosby, the principal at Grace James. She did this first and we thought it was a really great idea. And so we kind of redid our parking lot. So what you can see as you're looking at is uh, that whole front lot now, they're all reserved for visitors. There, there, there are no, the only reserved spots that exist anymore are for visitors. Um, and then for handicap accessibility. Aside from that, it's you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. All right, the next thing was really, really a game changer. So we, as I mentioned, we're, we have a multilingual community. And so in the past, what we were really proud of is our, our family handbook that was about this thick that went home. We had it in English, but we'd also had it translated into our top three languages. 
and that's a great that's a great move in the right direction. But what we were finding was that even with it being translated, it still wasn't being read. And y'all, I am a parent. I know you heard my girls graduated. My kids were here at Kenwood when they were little, but even in their middle and high school, I don't know about you, but I'd get the handbook and I'd do what probably most of you do as well. Flip to the page and tear out the page and had sign and send it in. I had no idea what I was signing, but it was a requirement or my kids got extra credit or something like that. So I did that. Well, yeah. Is it any wonder why parents don't know what's going on? It's because we're setting them up to fail. So what we did was we, um, we instituted, uh, our family handbook. So let me um, let me let me change this. Maybe I will change this. Let's see here if I can open it. Hang on just a second. I gotta open it first. Hang on. Maybe maybe not. Let me stop sharing and then let me find it for you all. Look, and I did attend the session through yesterday. So here it's still never as good in person, right? There's always one tech glitch. Just got to expect it anymore. Okay, well, clearly, um, yeah, there it is. Okay, so let me get to this. All right, so here's our family handbook. You all can see that, yes? All right, so what we did was we took what we felt to be the top priorities that we wanted families to know, okay? Not all bazillion things that are in there, that's attached, but really if there are a few things that we want families to know, what is it? And so what we did was we went through. Now I'm ready to be amazed you all, and I have to give credit to uh, Ms. McDonald and then one of our coaches, Christy Manley, who worked on this and created it. So one, what are you noticing? Less print. Two, there are pictures to support things, but get ready for the magic to happen. There's the calendar because that's an old one. You ready for it? There it is. There are, and it's going to, of course, not load quickly, but essentially um, there are videos. So if you're a car rider, you will drive to the side parking lot of Cambridge Elementary. You will enter and drive up and turn. Okay, we don't have time to watch the whole video. Um, but essentially, we kind of go through and we've embedded videos of actual kids doing actual things with some of our most important um, things for parents to be able to see. So even if language is a barrier, um, then you can you can see it and watch it with your child. And so we kind of embed this watching this this handbook back into our um, our back to school bash so that all families are um, so that all of our families are um, are watching it and we know that they're watching it. So so that was really kind of a game changer for us um, as it relates to um, to communicating with families. All right, the next one. Um, and this this has to do with honoring culture and expertise. And so uh, when you when you know this, and I think we're running out of time too, but uh, I have linked this video, but um, funds of knowledge. And so you think about when uh, when what most first encounters with families look like. It looks something like, Hi, I'm Miss Hanley. I'm going to be your child's teacher and let me tell you all about my classroom and all about my roles and all about everything that I do and we do, right? That stuff is important, but I want you to relate that to the last person, new person you met. If the last new person that you met in your personal life sat down and said, hi, I'm Jill, and let me tell you about how wonderful I am and all that I am and blah, blah, and time was up, and they never engaged with anything about you, you probably wouldn't want to engage in that relationship again. Well, the same is true with our families. So our first encounter with families is really centered around the funds of knowledge. And, and so where we're sitting down and saying like, you know, hi, I'm Ms. Hanley. I'm your child's teacher. I'm so excited to have you all here this year. And so what I want to do is just learn about, you know, you are your child's first expert, and I want to learn about your child and your family. And really, you know, we have a set of questions that are centered around the funds of knowledge and we're, it's pretty much a get to know you and we're there, the spotlight, not us. Um, and so what that does is that that just sends away that message of family meetings are not all about us, sending the, the families you are valued and that increases the sense of belonging for our students and our families. All right. This was a big one for us. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a, it was, this is one of those humbling experiences that I talked about. And so uh, I would always ask, are you doing school to families or are you doing school with families? And for most of us, we think we're doing it with, 
but we're really not. We're doing it too. And we experienced this in multiple occasions. We we planned this event, literacy event, you name it. We planned a family event and we all teachers were hands on deck. We spent thousands of dollars. We had the food. We had the everything. We sent the invitations. We thought we were ready. And then about 25 families showed up. Huh? And who were we mad at? The families. Who should we be mad at? Ourselves. Because guess who we didn't ask about any of the planning? The families. Imagine that. Actually co-constructing with them. Um, another great example was is when we were reimagining school after coming back from the pandemic, we decided, okay, we're going to do Kenwood 2.0. So we had all these great ideas. And I remember we sat down, Crystal Hawkins, who used to be our family engagement lead for our district. We're like, Crystal, listen to this great idea. And we're talking about how we're rolling out. She was like, so what do your parents think? And we said, well, we don't know. We haven't shared it with them yet. She said, well, 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 well hold on. Are you going to unroll all this greatness and you haven't engaged them in their voice yet? Ooh, yeah, I felt about this big. So embarrassing share, but that is the truth. And so, oh, take a few steps back. So that's just, if you're really wanting to know what they think, uh, send out a survey. And that's what that survey is there, just a Google form in the video, just as me saying like, hey, families, we're coming back. We want to know what you think. Uh, what would, um, if it was a perfect place for your child, what would it look like? What would make your child really enjoy learning? If it were a magical place, what would it look like? And then guess what we did? we actually use their voice to make it make a decision. I'm being a little facetious here because how many times do we send out surveys and we do nothing with them? How many times do we fill out a survey and then recognize nobody really wanted to hear our voice? So with this component, you have to be really ready to listen to their voices because if you're not, don't ask. And that's that's that sounds like a no brainer and that's not an insult, but there's a certain governance that you have to set up to be ready to hear voices of what families have to say. Um, and then once you get those voices, I encourage you to think, are you getting representation of all your voices? Because what we found is that early on, we thought we were getting pretty good feedback. And then when we started to disaggregate the data, we were getting plenty of feedback from our white families, which only comprises 38% of our population. So we were making a lot of family decisions based on one subset of our population. So we really had to go deeper. This over here on the left, this is just last week, this is our, we're planning for our Mesa Latina Encore. And so there are some of our Latinx families in here helping us plan our, our Mesa Latina Encore. So it's super exciting. All right, and then the last one around community partnerships, uh, working together for sustainable systems. It's like I talked about in the, in the beginning. If you're going to continue it, you have to be thoughtful and the thought has to be, how am I going to sustain this? And even with a great school-based team, we still need more. We still need families and we need community partners. What's important about community partners is to build capacity so we can empower families and provide wraparound services. Um, so how do you go about doing that? Well, you can do asset mapping, looking through to see what, what community partners are in your, your surrounding area. What are your needs? What do they have to offer? The one thing I will say is that we had to be very mindful of is nobody likes a one-way take taker relationship. So how are it's how are you showing reciprocity with community partners? The truth of the matter is thank you never seems enough, but oftentimes that's all they're really looking for. Or invite them into your school. Um, I have a principal's cabinet and that involves community members where they come in, get them in the school and see the kids. That's all they really want. And then I've already mentioned our community ambassador position for Ms. Cook. All right, so that was a whole lot. Um, there is the bit.ly um, QR code or the bit.ly if you are wanting to, uh, I did create a Padlet that has um, some resources on there, some of the videos that were in there, and then some of the things that we didn't mention are in there as well. Um, and so my time is almost up. If you have additional questions, I guess we have a few minutes to chat, but if not, then there is my contact information that's outside of, of um of JCPS. I did include, I did a whole season on the podcast about family engagement. So I included all those links in there if you want to start listening to that. Um, and then aside from that, uh, whew, I think I did it all in two minutes to spare. Wow, that was incredible. I'm so inspired. Um, so much good stuff. I already know the stuff you're doing and I'm still blown away. Um, are there questions? Jill is a wealth of knowledge. I appreciate that, Brooke. It's empowering stuff. I mean, literally when you are co-creating with families, which we know it's just the gold level, um, it's it's a powerful place to be. Um, it's so it's just so heartwarming to just hear families come in and things that when even when you think you've thought of everything, you haven't thought of half of it. And families come in with all these great ideas. So please, 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 please engage your families, but make sure that you've got the system set up for that. 
Yeah. And, and a lot of times I think it results, we hear a lot, it's smarter, not harder work for sure, because you're trying to get that 25 families to 50 families and you're just wearing yourself out trying to get 50 families to show up. And if you just pull four families aside and be like, why aren't you guys coming? They'll tell you. Absolutely. And maybe the time, maybe as simple as the time, it may be as simple as the invitation, or it might be just the wrong event for the wrong, you know, not meeting a need. Um, so sometimes you can save yourself a lot of exhaustion by bringing families in early. Um, donuts with dad, muffins with mom, always that way. How do we get more dads to show up? Well, pull three dads aside and ask them, are you going to show up to donuts with dad? What would make you show up? What would you rather just do? And they'll tell you.